quick and go live. All right, we're back with Thomas Taylor's dissertation on the philosophy of Aristotle. And we are in now, I believe, a quote from Simplicius commenting on um, this. I should have read this before we started, but that's fine. Um, yeah, so he's commenting on Aristotle's section. So we before reviewed Aristotle's objections to the theory of the elements found in Timaeus, and then we had Proclus's uh, objections. And yep, um, here, yeah, I'm actually going to go back a little bit just so we can all get some review. So in the first place, Aristotle says in chapter two of the first book of his physics that it is necessary there should either be one principle or more than one, and if one, that it should be either immovable, as Parmenides and Melissa say, or moved, as the natural philosophers assert, some of whom say that the first principle is air and others water, okay, et cetera. So he's reviewing uh, the discussion of first principles by previous philosophers. Uh, to consider, therefore, whether being is one and immovable does not belong to the speculation concerning nature, but metaphysics. And uh, now we move to this passage by Simplicius, where he expands on the views of the earlier philosophers. Um, and he also asserts that Aristotle is contradicting the apparent meanings of the pre-Socratics, whereas Simplicius and also Ammonius before him had this interpretation that the ancients all actually shared this kind of one universal Hellenic uh, mystery school philosophy. Um, and so like the apparent problems with the monism of the Eleatics um, are only because of their manner of presentation, which was metaphorical and the masses would confuse that kind of metaphorical uh, significance kind of bastardize it. So let's now start here. This is just a little bit before where we ended last time. Comprehending, so this is a quote from Simplicius now, commentary on the physics. Comprehending, however, all the opinions of the ancient philosophers from a more perfect division, we may thus accede to the meaning of Aristotle. It is necessary, therefore, that there should be either one principle or not one, i.e. more than one, and if one, that it should either be immovable or moved, and if immovable, that it should be either finite, infinite, as uh, Melissus the Samian appears to say, or finite, as Parmenides the Elian seems to assert, these philosophers not speaking about a physical element, but about true being. But Theophrastus says that Xenophanes and Colophonian, Colophonian the preceptor of Parmenides, asserted that there is one principle, or in other words, the one which is being and all, and is neither finite nor infinite. Right, so their real meaning, according to Theophrastus, which is probably from a fragment we don't actually have, according to Theophrastus, uh, it, the underlying meaning was more this kind of uh, apophatic description, transcending categories. Um, you, know, you know, Zeno is said to like treat the one by what it is not, or like disproving the many, and then Parmenides proves the one in the dialogue of Parmenides. So there's some, uh, you know, weight to the idea that these are just different kind of symbolical modes of presenting the same mystic philosophy. Um, going on, Theophrastus at the same time acknowledging that the recording this opinion belongs rather to another narration than that concerning nature. For Xenoph uh, Xenophanes says that this one and all is the divinity whom he shows to be one from his being the most powerful of all things. For, says he, since beings are many, it is in like manner necessary that there should be a ruler over all. But the most powerful and best of all things is God. He likewise shows that this one is unbegotten from the necessity of that which is generated, being generated either from the similar or the dissimilar. But the similar, says he, is not passive to the similar because it is it no more belongs to the similar to generate than to be generated by the similar. And if it were generated from the dissimilar, being would be from non-being. And he 
Thus he demonstrates that it is unbegotten and eternal. He likewise shows that it is neither infinite nor finite. So this is Xenophanes expanding the same true philosophy that Parmenides and the others, or some of the others, held to. Neither infinite nor finite, for it is not infinite because it has neither beginning nor middle nor end, nor finite because it is the many which mutually bound each other. In like manner, he takes away from it motion and rest, for he says that non-being is immovable because neither can anything else approach to it, nor it to anything else, and it is the many that are moved, for one thing changes into another, so that when he says it abides in the same and is not moved, but nothing which is moved abides in the same, and that it does not proceed, since if it did, it would be differently moved at different times, he does not say that it abides according to the rest which is opposed to motion, but according to that which is exempt from motion and rest. So we have two species of rest, the literal and then kind of the anagogic or higher significance of rest, which is beyond the categorical dichotomy. Just like the one is not a strict simplicity in a cataphatic sense, but it is non-dual. So uh, apophatically, we characterize it as one and sort of symbolically. But Nicholas Dam uh, Damascenus, in his treatise concerning the gods, relates that Xen Xenophanes asserted the one principle to be infinite and immovable, but Alexander says that he celebrated it as finite and spherical. However, that he demonstrated it to be neither infinite nor finite is evident from what has been said, but he asserted it to be finite and spherical, though it's being on all sides, through its being on all sides similar. Right, so again, um, you see the same description in Parmenides himself. And so that description of like being, being uh, equal distant from all at, at the sides, from the center, at all points, like that's a metaphorical, not a literal geometric description of the nature of the cosmos. He likewise affirms that it understands all things for he says, all things with mind it shakes from mental toil remote. But of those who say that there is one immovable principle, whom Aristotle calls properly natural philosophers, some say that it is finite, as Thales the Milesian, and Hippon, who appears to have been an atheist, and call the principle water, being led to this from the sensible phenomena. For the hot lives by the moist, and things which are about to perish become dry. The seeds, likewise, of all things are moist, and all aliment, food, is juicy." But that from which a thing derives its being, from this it is naturally adapted to be nourished, and water is the principle of a moist nature and is connective of all things. On which account they apprehended water to be the principle of all things, and affirmed that the earth is situated under water. But Thales is said to have been the first who unfolded to the Greeks the history of nature. And though, as it appears to Theophrastus, there were many others prior to him, yet he very much differed from them and eclipsed all his predecessors. Okay, so Thales was supposed to be a uh, natural historian among his other accomplishments. Like some uh, mathematical theorems are attributed to him tentatively and uh, some astronomical discoveries, although how much... He was just sort of reiterating Phoenician uh, teachings is not clear. Some people uh, report Thales to have been from a prominent Phoenician family in Miletus. But not universally so. He is said, however, to have left nothing in writing except what is called his nautical astrology. Hippasus, the Metapontine, and Heraclitus, the Ephesian, admitted that there is one movable and finite principle, but they said that it is fire, and they asserted that all things are from it through the assistance of rarity and density. They also again dissolved all things into fire, as if this were the one subject nature of things. For they said that there is a vicissitude of fire, but Heraclitus made all things to subsist together with a certain order and definite time of the mutation of the world according to a certain fatal necessity. And these philosophers, indeed, from surveying the vivific, demiurgic, digestive, and universally pervading and alter, uh, alterative nature of heat, entertained this opinion. Hence, conformably to this opinion, they did not admit this principle to be infinite, 
again, if an element is the least from which other things are generated and into which they are resolved, but fire is the most attenuated and subtle of other things, this will be especially an element. And these indeed are those who asserted that there is one movable and finite element of things. So the Eleatics were attributed more of a kind of mystic apophatic view that gets confused uh, than the uh, Ionian philosophers, the earliest uh, kind of materialistic philosophers. Simplicius is not crediting with some kind of subtle mystic doctrine here. I think I've seen that talked about elsewhere and it's easy to interpret the so-called materialistic philosophers as describing some kind of more esoteric metaphysical doctrine. Like maybe Thales wasn't saying things are literally water, but maybe the water means like the formlessness of matter. So he maybe it was more of like a form matter combination philosophy, but Simplicius is not saying that. So uh, Simplicius attributes like more of a mystic philosophy to Homer as well elsewhere, but it's not just universally all the pre-Socratics believed this, at least the materialist Ionian philosophers. He's giving views that are more kind of typical. Uh, like that's what people still say that Thales and Heraclitus believed. Moving on. But of those who say that there is one movable and infinite principle, Anaximander the Milesian, the son of Praxiades, and who was the successor and disciple of Thales, said that the infinite is the principle and element of beings, he being the first who introduced this name of principle. So Aperon is first introduced in philosophy by Anaximander. Anaxagoras also references the Aperon um, and characterizes it as a kind of mixed together chaos that preceded all things but he says that it is neither water nor any other of those that are called elements but another certain infinite nature from which all the heavens and all the worlds they contain are produced so since anaximander was the student of thales and an anaximander according to simplicius here said that the foundational element was a certain infinite nature that strengthens this view that Thales' belief that all is water could be interpreted metaphorically, where that water is a certain kind of boundlessness, so comparable to the indefinite dyad. Moving on, he also said that into those things from which beings are generated, beings ought also to be corrupted. For employing more poetic language, he says that alternate generations and corruptions are assigned to some things, and that punishment is inflicted on injustice according to the order of time. But it is evident that he, surveying the mutation of the four elements into each other, did not think fit to make one of these the subject of things, but something else besides these. He therefore did not conceive that generation is affected from the alteration of the elements, but from the separation of contraries through an eternal motion. Some similarities to Heraclitus there. On which account also Aristotle ranks him among the followers of Anaxagoras. Um, Anaximander was earlier than Anaxagoras. So I feel like there's some kind of corruption of the text here. Yeah, this is not clear because Anaxagoras was quite a bit later, like a century later. All right, uh, but Anaximenes the Milesian, the son of Eurystrates, and who was the associate of Anaximander, says that there is one infinite subject nature in the same manner as Anaximander, yet not indefinite, as he said it was, but definite, and which he calls air. He also asserts that things differ in rarity and density according to their essences, and that when this subject nature is divided, fire is generated, but when it is condensed, wind, afterwards a cloud, when still more condensed, water, afterwards earth, and afterwards stones. But he says the other things are produced from these. He likewise makes motion to be perpetual, through which also mutation is produced. And Diogenes Apolloniates 
Apollonia teas, all right? Indeed, who was nearly the most recent of those who applied themselves to these speculations, wrote many useful things, sometimes speaking according to the doctrine of Anaxagoras, and at other times according to that of Leucippus. He also says that the nature of the universe is air, and that it is infinite and perpetual, from which being condensed and rarefied and changing its qualities, the form of other things is produced. And these things indeed, Theophrastus relates concerning Diogenes. One of his writings also came into my hands, inscribed Concerning Nature, in which he clearly says that air is that from which all things are generated. Nicolaus, moreover, relates that he adopted an element between fire and air. And these philosophers indeed conceived that the easily passive and alter alterative nature of air is adapted to mutation. Hence, they did not think fit to admit earth as a principle because it is with difficulty moved and changed. And thus are those uh, divided who said that there is one principle only. Okay. Uh, but of those who said that there are many principles, some asserted that the principles are finite and others that they are infinite in number. So here we have the kind of fourfold division. We have those who said it was one and finite, one and infinite. And now we have the many principles which are themselves finite or the many principles that are themselves infinite. And this is all Simplicius expanding on Aristotle's reference to uh, all of these previous um, schools of thought on first principles. And of those who contended that they are finite, some said they are two, as Parmenides in his writings, according to opinion, viz. fire and earth, or rather light and darkness, or as the Stoics say, God and matter. Not indeed calling God a principle as an element, but as that which is effective and matter as that which is passive. But some, as Aristotle said that there, um, oh, I see, For, but some, as Aristotle said that there are three principles, matter, and the contraries, form and privation. According to others, as Empedocles the Agrigentine, there are four, who was not much posterior in time to Anaxagoras, and was allied to an emulus of Parmenides, and still more of the Pythagoreans. But he made four corporeal elements, fire and air, water and earth, which are indeed perpetual in multitude and paucity, but are changed according to mixture and separation. And he asserted that the proper principles by which these are moved are friendship and strife. Empedocles, friendship and strife. For it is necessary that elements which are moved should be alternately disposed, at one time being mingled by friendship and at another separated by strife. So that according to him there are six principles, for he gives a productive power to friendship and strife, when he says... By friendship's aid, we sometimes into one all things collect, and sometimes strife detains all things apart, discordant, borne along. So the six principles are the four elements plus love and strife. He also then arranges these two as coordinate to the four elements when he says, Oft many things to one there being, O oh, fire, water, earth, and air immensely high. And each with equal power is found endued when strife pernicious is from each apart, and friendship equalized in length and breadth. And Plato, indeed, establishes three principles properly so called, viz., that which produces the paradigm and the end, and also three con causes, matter, form, and instrument. Right, so efficient cause, paradigmatic cause, paradigmatic cause. And final cause are the true principles for Plato, says Simplicius. And then the con causes, mundane, formal, material, and instrumental cause. Uh, yeah, Simplicius already attributes to Plato himself, although the instrumental cause um, seems to have been brought out later. Not even Proclus mentions instrumental cause, I believe. But Theophrastus, after having given the history of other philosophers, says that Plato succeeded these, being prior to them in renown and ability, but posterior in time, 
and that though he, for the most part, directed his attention to the first philosophy, yet he also gave himself to the phenomena, and slightly meddled with the history of nature, in which he wished to introduce two principles, the one a subject, as matter, which he denominates the universal recipient, and the other a cause and mover, which he suspends from a divine nature and the power of the good. And some, indeed, have extended principles as far as to the decad, though not elementary principles. Thus the Pythagoreans say that numbers from the monad, as far as to the decad, are the principles of all things, or the ten coordinations which different persons have differently described. And after this manner are those divided who said that principles are many and finite in multitude. Uh, the ten coordinations, footnote nine, according to Aristotle, in the first book of his Metaphysics, are as follows, bound the infinite, the odd, the even. This is the table of opposites. The one, multitude. Right hand, left hand. The masculine, the feminine. The quiescent, or stationary, and that which is in motion. The straight and curved. Light, darkness. Good, evil. The square and the oblong. But of those who said that they are infinite in multitude, some asserted that they are simple, not homogeneous, and contraries but characterized by that which predominates. For Anaxagoras, indeed, the Clazomenian, the son of Agasibulus, and who was a partaker of the philosophy of Anaximenes. Okay, that's, so that's important. Simplicius says Anaxagoras followed an Anaximenes. And of course, Anaximenes, we already saw, had similarities to Anaximander, uh, but didn't say that the principle was indefinite. It was rather air. Um, and Anaxagoras follows Anaximenes, Simplicius says. Um, so Anaxagoras first transmuted the opinions concerning principles and supplied the deficient cause making the corporeal principles to be infinite. For he said that all those things which have similar parts, such as water or fire or gold, are unbegotten and incorruptible and that they appear to be generated and corrupted through mixture and separation alone. Okay. So the elements are unbegotten and incorruptible. They appear to be generated through mixture and separation only. All things indeed being in all, but each being characterized by that in it which predominates. So this is a kind of materialistic version of the Neoplatonic doctrine that all is in all, but according to each. For according to him, that appears to be gold, in which there is much of a golden nature, though all things are inherent in it. And Axagoras, therefore, says that in everything there is a part of everything. And this, Theophrastus observes, and Axagoras says, conformable to an Aximander. For he says that things of a kindred nature tend to each other in the separation of the infinite, and that gold was generated from a separation of the gold which was in the universe, earth by a separation of earth, and in like manner each of the rest, as not being generated but having a prior subsistence. Anaxagoras also asserted that intellect is the cause of the motion and generation of things, by which, being separated, they generated the worlds and the nature of other things. Whence, says Theophrastus, if the assertions of Anaxagoras are thus considered, he may appear to have made infinite material principles, and that there is one cause, viz. intellect, of motion and generation. But if anyone should uh, apprehend that the mixture of all things is one nature, indefinite both according to form and according to magnitude, it will happen that, he says, there are two principles, the nature of the infinite and intellect so that he appears to have introduced corporeal elements similar to Anaximander. But Archelaus, the Athenian, with whom also they say Socrates associated, having been the disciple of Anaxagoras in his treatise on the generation of the world and in his other writings, endeavored to introduce some peculiar doctrine of his own. He admitted, however, the same principles as Anaxagoras, these philosophers, therefore, say that the principles are infinite in multitude and of dissimilar genre, at the same time asserting that they consist of similar parts, but through what cause they were of this opinion, Aristotle will shortly inform us. 
for denying that there is generation because that which is generated must necessarily be generated either from being or from non-being and each of these being impossible they ascribed apparent generation and corruption to mixture and separation right so because generation is impossible it's only apparent uh all things all like real ingredients of things are eternal and they're just mixed and separated giving the appearance of generation which uh you know makes sense with the doctrine that all is in all as well so our uh, archelaus contemporary of plato um also held that but lucippus the elian or the milesian for he is said to be either of these having been a partaker of the philosophy of Parmenides, did not proceed in the same way with Parmenides and Xenophanes concerning beings, but, as it seems, in a contrary path. For they made the universe to be one, immovable, unbegotten, and finite, and did not even admit the investigation of non-being. But he asserted that the elements of things, viz. atoms, are infinite and always moved, and that there is an infinite multitude of figures in them, because without figure nothing is this more than that, surveying this never-failing generation and mutation in beings. He also asserted that being had not more a subsistence than non-being, and that both are similarly causes to generated natures. So that's important for... Uh, Lucippus, uh, the atomist, that he, it wasn't just atoms that were the principles, but also being and non-being. In what sense non-being is cause of generation for Lucippus? I'm not sure, but just a little fact to remember. For having adopted the hypothesis that the essence of atoms is the solid and the full, he said this is being. Okay, well, that's good. We have an explanation immediately of what's meant by being and non-being. So the essence of atoms is solid and full, that's being, and that it is moved in a vacuum, which he called non-being, and which he says is not inferior to being. So we have matter in the vacuum being being and non-being for Lucippus. In a similar manner also, his associate, Democritus the Abderite, established as principles the full and the void one of which he calls being, the other non-being. For considering atoms as matter to beings, they generate other things from the differences of these, and these are three, rhythmos, trope, and diathege, viz. figure, order, and position. For, say they, the similar is naturally adapted to be moved by the similar, and kindred beings naturally tend to each other. Each of the figures, likewise, being arranged into a different mixture, produces a different disposition, so that, since the principles are infinite, they very properly declare that they can assign all qualities and essences together with that from which and how they are produced. Hence, they say, that all things happen according to reason to those alone who admit that there are infinite elements and who say that the multitude of figures in the atoms is infinite, because without figure nothing is more this than that, for they assign this as the cause of infinity. Metrodorus also, the Chian, nearly adopted the same principles as the followers of Democritus, asserting that the full and the void are the first causes of things, of which the former is being, but the latter non-being, but about other things he introduced a method peculiar to himself, such, then, is the concise account of what is handed down. So we, we don't have what distinguished Metrodorus, just that he had some peculiar doctrines of his own. All right. This has mostly just been a kind of review of uh, pre-Socratic notions. Such, then, is the concise account of what is handed down to us by history concerning principles, not written indeed according to time, but according to the agreement of opinion. It is not, however, fit to think, on hearing these differences, that they are contradictions of those who philosophized, which some, meeting with merely historical writings and understanding nothing which they relate, endeavor to defame. Though they are themselves divided by an infinity of dissensions, not about physical principles, for of these they have not even a dreaming perception, but about the subversion of the divine transcendency. Uh, footnote 1. Simplicius, in what he here says, alludes to the Christians and most properly to their disputes about the Trinity. Okay. 
Um, yeah. So hearing the differences among the pre-Socratics, Simplicius says, it is not fit to think they are contradictions of those who philosophized. So this, again, is where I'm kind of getting this idea that Simplicius held that there was kind of a universal Hellenic mystery school philosophy and the seeming like seeming differences between the schools maybe weren't as dramatic as they appeared. Uh, just like Simplicius wants to harmonize Aristotle and Plato. Going on. It may not perhaps, however, be improper, digressing a little, to show the more studious how the ancients, though they appear to differ in their opinions concerning principles, yet at the same time harmoniously agree. Right, so that is uh, what I was saying before. For some of them spoke concerning the intelligible and first principle, as Xenophanes, Parmenides, and Melissus, and Xenophanes indeed, and Parmenides call it one and finite, for it is necessary that the one should subsist prior to multitude, that the cause of bound and termination to all things should rather be defined according to bound than infinity, and that the every way perfect, and which has received its proper end, should be finite, or rather that it should be the end and principle of all things, for the imperfect being indigent has not yet received termination." except, indeed, that Xenophanes considers this principle as the cause of all things, as transcending all things, and as beyond all motion and rest, as, a, as opposite arrangement, in the same manner as Plato, in his first hypothesis of his Parmenides. But Parmenides, beholding this principle as subsisting according to sameness, and in a similar manner as beyond all mutation, and perhaps energy and power, celebrated it as immovable and alone, as being exempt from all things, as when he says, the one immovable has every name. Melissus too, in a similar manner, surveyed the immutable, but asserted that it was infinite, as well as unbegotten, according to never-failing essence and infinite power. But this is evident from his demonstration concerning the infinite, which is framed according to the following conception. For he says, quote, Since therefore it was not generated... It is, and always was, and will be, and has neither beginning nor end, but is infinite, for if it were generated, it would have a beginning, since that which was once generated must have a beginning and an end, for it will die. But since it neither began to be, nor will die, but always was, it has neither beginning nor end, but is infinite. Thus, therefore, Melissus, looking to that which, according to his, uh, excuse me, looking to that which, according to time, is without beginning and end, and perpetual being asserts that this principle is infinite. Parmenides also testifies a thing of this kind concerning it when he says, in nearly the same words, quote, Being is unproduced, without decay, unshaken, single, whole, without an end, nor once it was, nor will hereafter be, since it is now one simultaneous all. After this manner, therefore, he says that it is never failing, unbegotten, and infinite but he manifests the conception of bound by the following verse. Verses. Same in the same, and by itself abides, so firm it there remains held in the bonds of bound by strong necessity on every side, unlawful hence that being without bound should e'er remain, remain, for want it never knows, but to non-being perfect want belongs. For if it is being, and not non-being, it is unindigent, but being unindigent, it is perfect, and being perfect, it has an end, and is not unfinished. So even Parmenides, in some respects, terms the first principle of things uh, finite, in another respect, infinite. But having an end, it possesses bound and limitation. Thus, therefore, according to the conceptions of these men, there is no contrariety in their assertions concerning this principle. But Parmenides, passing from intelligibles to sensibles, or as he says, from truth to opinion in the following verses, quote, Here about truth, firm thoughts and reasonings end, opinions, human, now, attentive, learn, clothed in fallacious ornament of words. T uh, Simplicius, he established as the first elementary principles of generated natures, the first opposition, which he calls light and darkness, fire and earth, of the dense and the rare, or same and different, as is evident from the verse, uh, the verses which follow those just recited. 
quote, Names they to forms from two opinions give, improper one in which they wander wide. Op uh, opposing natures, separate they ranked, body and signals, each from each apart. Hence, in one class, ethereal flaming fire, mild, rare, and light, and like itself throughout, they ranged, but in the class opposed to this, a nature wholly contrary they placed, body nocturnal, gravitating, dense. Simplicius, the meaning of Parmenides in these verses appears to be in prose as follows. In the one series, there is the rare and the hot, the luminous, the soft, and the light, but in the dense are denominated the cold and the dark, the hard and the heavy, for in these each is separated from the other. After this manner, therefore, he plainly assumes two elements opposed to each other. Hence, prior to this, he separates the one being and says that they err who do not perceive the opposition of the elements which compose generation or who do not clearly unfold it. And Aristotle, following Parmenides, establishes the principles of things to be contraries. Parmenides also clearly delivers the producing cause, not only of the bodies which are in generation, but also of the incorporeal natures which give completion to generation when he says, quote, But these to night belong, resplendent fate succeeds, and in the midst the power divine who governs all, for he of hateful births and copulations the source he sends the female with the male to mix, and then the male again, the female to embrace. Empedocles also teaching us concerning the intelligible and the sensible world, and establishing the former as the archetypal pattern of the latter, places in each, as principles and elements, these four, fire, air, earth, and water, and as producing causes, friendship, and strife, except that things in the intelligible world, being vanquished by intelligible union, are said to be rather collected together by friendship, but things in the sensible world to be rather separated by strife. And with him Plato accords, or prior to Plato, Timaeus, who says that in the first intelligible paradigm, four ideas presubsist characterized from the four elements and producing this sensible world, distributed into four parts among the last of things, strife here having dominion through a separation departing from intelligible union. Empedocles also speaks in common about both worlds, except that placing the elements in the ratio of matter, he surveys about them the contrariety of friendship and strife. For that friendship alone did not, as the vulgar think, produce, according to Empedocles, the intelligible world, nor strife alone, the sensible world, but that he surveyed both everywhere in an appropriate manner, is evident from what he says in his physics, in which he asserts that Venus, or friendship, is the cause of the commixture which is here. But he calls fire, Vulcan, the sun, and flame, but water he calls rain, and air, ether. And he says these things indeed in many places, and also in the following verses. Quote, all shining ether, Vulcan, showers of rain, earth above all things, equally obtains, established in fair Venus, perfect ports, whether the small to great or more to less is changed. Blood and the forms of other flesh from these were made. And prior to these verses, he delivers in others the energy of both these in the same things as follows. When at the bottom of the whirlpool deep strive, uh, strife had arrived and love was in the midst, all things in this were gathered into one, and from their mixture countless mortal tribes arose, though many things unmingled stood with strife endurance had detained on high, uh, rather which, which strife endurance had detained on high, for to the utmost limits of the orb, not without blame, the universe withdrew. But of its members some remained within, and some departed from the mingled whole. Whatever, too, strife's victorious force destroyed, this blameless love with all propitious aid, immortal impulse, constantly restored. Then instant mortal natures that before had learnt to be immortal sprung to light, Unmingled, once and pure, they changed their paths, and from their mixture countless mortal tribes arose, all form of forms, all various, wondrous to the view. Simplicius. In these verses, he clearly says that mortal natures were harmonized from friendship, and that in those in which friendship has dominion, strife was not yet perfectly exterminated. 
uh, in those verses also, in which he clearly delivers the marks or tokens by which the four elements are known, as likewise friendship and strife, he indicates the mixture of these two in all things. But the verses are as follow. Quote, Dark and tremendous... Uh, dark and tremend tremendous rain in all is seen, but trees and solids from the earth are poured. In wrath, all biformed natures separate or separate lie, but in love mingling for each other burn. From these, what was, is, will be, is derived from these trees blossom, men and women spring beasts, birds, and fishes that in water live, and long-lived gods transcendently renowned. And again, shortly after, he adds, In part they govern the revolving orbs, into each other perish, and by turns of fate increase, for such their nature is. But th uh, through each other, when again they run, then men arise, and countless ills beside, into one world they now together come, through friendship, each divided, born along, is now by strife subdued. And while these two conascent are, the whole beneath is born. Alternate hence, from many one is formed, and many to perfection rise from one. Hence, as begotten not to these belongs, stable eternity, though changed, however, throughout. Yet, since the change is endless, they remain immovable in one eternal orb. Right. So again, uh, there's not like, it's not one or the other. Um, so Parmenides in some respects highlighted the unity in, in others, the unlimitedness of the first principle of things here. Empedocles is emphasizing both aspects, but saying ultimately um, there's sort of a coincidence of opposites in the first principles of things. So that, so Simplicius, so that the subsistence of one thing from many, which happens through friendship, and of many from one, which is affected by the domination of strife, Empedocles also surveys in this sublunary world in which mortal natures exist according to periods that are different at different times, at one time strife, and at another time friendship having dominion. Perhaps, too, he delivers a certain procession of the union and separation of beings, obscurely signifying the many differences of the intelligible among uh, above this sensible world, according to the more or less domination of friendship, and in the sensible world shows the differences of the dominion of strife comprehended in certain bounds, as in other parts of his poem he endeavors to demonstrate, except that he also does not assert anything contrary to Parmenides and Melissus, but as well as Parmenides surveyed the elementary opposition. Parmenides also admitted that there is one common efficient cause of all generation, which is established in the midst of all things, and which cause is a divine power, but Empedocles surveyed the opposition in the efficient cause. So Parmenides noted the one efficient cause, Empedocles is saying even within that efficient cause there is this opposition, the two philosophies are not necessarily opposed. But Anaxagoras, the Clasimenian, appears to have surveyed the triple difference of all forms, one contracted in intelligible union, as when he says, all things were together infinite, both in multitude and smallness. And again, before these were separated, all things subsisted together, no one color was apparent, for the mixture of all things prevented this, viz. of the moist and the dry, the hot and the cold, the splendid and the dark, being abundantly inherent together with seeds, infinite in multitude, none of which resembled each other. But things thus subsisting, it is necessary that all things in the universe should appear to be one. This universe, therefore, or all, of Anaxagoras, will be the one being of Parmenides. But Anaxagoras appears to have surveyed another difference, distinguished according to intellectual separation, to which the difference in the sensible world is assimilated. For a little after the beginning of his first book concerning nature, he says as follows, quote, Things thus subsisting, it is necessary that many and all various things should appear to be one in all things which are collected together. Likewise, that there should be seeds of all things, possessing all various ideas, colors, and pleasures. Also, that men and such other animals as possess a soul should be mingled with each other, together with cities inhabited by men and works such as are among us. 
Likewise, that the inhabitants there should have a sun and moon and whatever else we possess, and that the earth should produce for them many and all various things, which they necessarily employ to the useful service of their habitation. And thus much I have said concerning the separation of things, because not only the things which are with us are separated according to Anaxagoras, but also others. Perhaps, indeed, he may appear to some not to compare the separation which is in generation with that which is intellectual, but to contrast our habitation with other places of the earth. If this, however, were the case, he would not have said concerning other places that they had a sun and a moon, and other things such as are with us, nor that they had seeds there, and the ideas of all things." Let us also hear what he says a little after, when he makes a comparison of both. Quote, Thus, therefore, departing and being separated by force and swiftness, swiftness produces force, but their swiftness does not resemble the swiftness of any thing which is now among men, but is entirely multifariously swift. If, therefore, Anaxagoras had this conception, he says that all things are in all, in one way according to intelligible union, but in another according to intellectual connection, and in another according to sensible conspiration, and generation from the same, and analysis into the same. So this seems like heavy, like, neoplatonizing uh, of Anaxagoras, uh, but, yeah, that's that's the like the last Neoplatonists, their project is kind of saying how actually all the way back to Homer, they were all Neoplatonists. Um, all right, we can keep going. Again, Leucippus, Democritus, and the Pythagoric Timaeus are not adverse to the dogma that the four elements are the principles of composite bodies. And they, as well as the Pythagoreans, Plato, and Aristotle, surveying the mutations of fire, air, water, and perhaps of earth also into each other, investigated certain more principal and simple causes of these, through which also they defended the differences of these elements according to qualities. Thus indeed Timaeus, and Plato according with him, consider super, uh, superficies possessing a certain depth, and differences of figures, as the first elements of the four elements. Um... So the triangles have a thickness as the first elements of the four elements and are of opinion that a corporeal nature in conjunction with corporeal figures has a more principal subsistence and is the cause of the differences of qualities. Okay, so the differences in qualities of the elements is underlined by differences in corporeal arrangements, which is the Timaeus theory of the elements. But Leucippus and Democritus, calling the least first bodies atoms, were of opinion that they differed according to the difference of figure, position, and order, and they, and they denominated those bodies hot and fiery, which are composed from more acute and attenuated first bodies, and situated in a similar position. But they said that those bodies were coal and watery, which are composed from first bodies contrary to those just mentioned, and also that some of these atoms are splendid and luminous, but others obscure and dark. So I don't see how he's reconciling Leucippus and Democritus into this general pre-Socratic consensus. It seems like for the most part he's reconciled Empedocles and the Eleatics, and that's not surprising because all of them are kind of like influenced by Pythagoreanism, uh, but Leucippus and Democritus less so, even though Leucipp Leucippus apparently was a student of Parmenides. Obviously, he, he did uh, deviate. With respect to such also, as asserted that there is one element of things, as Thales and Aximander and Heraclitus, each of these directed his attention to the efficacious nature and aptitude to generation of this element. Thales, indeed, to the prolific, nutritive, connective, vital, and easily to be fashioned nature of water, but Heraclitus to the vivific and demiurgic nature of fire, and Anaximenes to to the plastic nature of air, and its easily receding on both sides, viz. to fire and to water, just as Anaximander also directed his attention to a middle element through its being easily susceptible of mutation. Thus, therefore, some looking to the intelligible, but others to the sensible order, some investigating the proximate elements of bodies, and others those which have more 
the relation of a principle, some considering that which is more partial and others that which is more total in an elementary nature, and some investigating elements alone, but others all causes and con causes assert different things in physiologizing, but not such as are contrary to him who is able to judge. So the basic line is like these different prescratics are dealing with different aspects of nature from different perspectives, but all of these various opinions are not actually contradictory. He didn't really attempt to reconcile the atomism of Democritus. So this seems a little bit uh, sleight of handy. Like he's he has a, a goal uh, exegetically here to assert this consensus, ancient consensus, and it's not terribly persuasive, but more so in the case of the Eleatics and Empedocles. Aristotle himself also, who seems to have indicated their dissonance, says a little further on that they differ from each other because some assume prior and others posterior principles, some things more known according to reason and others according to sense. So even Aristotle says the reason they differ is that they talk about higher level principles and lower level principles and some according to what is known by reason some according to what is known by sense so that he says in a certain respect their assertions are the same with and different from each other but i have been compelled to be thus prolix on account of those who are readily disposed to object to the ancients a disagreement in their opinions since, however, we shall hear Aristotle confuting the opinions of the more ancient philosophers and prior to Aristotle, Plato appears to have done this, and still prior to both these, Parmenides and Xenophanes, it must be observed that they, directing their attention to superficial readers, confute the apparent absurdity in the assertions of those philosophers, it being usual with the ancients to exhibit their opinions enigmatically. Yeah, he talks about that in his commentary in the uh, categories as well, that uh, all the ancient philosophers um, cloaked their true doctrines in different ways, in different kind of metaphorical garbs. Plato evinces the truth of this by so much admiring Parmenides, whom he seems to confute, and when he says that his conceptions require a profound diver. Um... Aristotle also appears to have suspected the profundity of his wisdom when he says Parmenides seems to have seen this. Hence, Plato and Aristotle, at one time supplying what the ancients have omitted, and at another time rendering conspicuous what they obscurely assert, at one time separating what is said of intelligibles as not being able to adapt it to physics, as when the ancients call being one and immovable, and at another time repressing the easy interpretations of the more superficial, thus appear to confute them. Aristotle, having spoken concerning those who assert <clears throat> that there is one physical principle which subsists as a subject, and having delivered the difference according to the twofold mode of generation from this subject, viz. that according to change in quality, and that according to separation, he proceeds in the next place to Empedocles and Anaxagoras, who said that the principle is both one and many. For Anaxagoras, introducing things of similar parts as subject principles, said that things are infinite. He also said that the producing cause is one, which is separating intellect. But Empedocles introduced as many subject principles, the four elements, but one efficient friendship and strife because each of them has dominion and produces alternately, and not both at once, for thus there is always, according to him, one efficient. Or, shall we say, that they did not assert that there is one efficient principle, but the mixture itself, which, according to Naxagoras, is mingled from things of similar parts, infinite in multitude, but according to Empedocles, from the four elements, as uh, at one time mingled together by friendship, and at another separated by strife, producing this world. But Theophrastus, classing Anaxagoras with Anaximander, considers what is asserted by Anaxagoras as if he admitted one subject nature, for Theophrastus, in his physical history, thus writes, quote, Since Anaxagoras admits these things, he may appear, as we have said, to make infinite material principles, but one cause of motion and generation, 
But if any one apprehends that the mixture of all things is one nature indefinite, both according to form and according to magnitude, which he may seem to be willing to say, it happens that he will assert there are two principles, the nature of the infinite and intellect, so that it will entirely appear that he introduces corporeal elements similar to an examander. But Aristotle very properly, after those who assert that there is one principle, and this either immovable or movable, ranks those who say there is one and many principles, prior to those who seem to say that there are many alone, as Democritus and his followers, for these have a middle order. But those who assert that there is one principle have something in common with those who make generation from commixture and separation. And Anaxagoras is more allied to those who suppose that the generation of things is affected by separation. But they differ from those who say there is only one principle because they assert that there is both one and many, but they differ from each other in the first place because Anaxagoras says that the world being once generated from the mixture remained afterwards governed and separated by presiding intellect, but Empedocles supposes that the world subsists alternately according to certain periods, at one time the mixture of the four elements being affected by friendship, and at another time their separation by strife. Sounds also like the myth from the statesman, the periods described there. And in the second place, they differ from each other because Anaxagoras supposes that the many principles from which the universe consists are infinite and of similar parts, but Empedocles supposes they are finite, for they are what are called the four elements. But that Anaxagoras, Simplicius adds, asserts that infinite things of similar parts are separated from a certain mixture, all things being in everything, but each being characterized by that which predominates, is evident from the first book of his physics, in the beginning of which he says, quote, all things were together, infinite both in multitude and smallness, for the small was infinite, and all things subsisting together, nothing was manifest through its smallness, for air and ether contained all things, both being infinite, since these which are the greatest, both in multitude and magnitude, are inherent in all things. And shortly after he observes, quote, For air and ether are separated from that which is abundant uh, that which abundantly contains, and that being contains Sorry, and that which contains is infinite in multitude. And soon after, he adds, quote, This being the case, it is requisite to see that there are many and all various things in all the mutual mixtures and seeds of all things, possessing all various ideas, colors, and pleasures. But before they were separated in consequence of all things subsisting together, no one color was manifest, for the commixture of all things prevented this, viz. of the moist and the dry, the hot and the cold, the splendid and the dark, much earth also being inherent, and infinite seeds in no respect dissimilar to each other. For of other things which were there, one did not appear to be different from the other. End quote. But that no one of these things of similar parts is generated or corrupted, but is always the same, he manifests as follows, quote, These being thus separated, it is requisite to know that all things are neither less nor more, for neither is it easy to be more than all things, but all things are always equal. Okay, this is what Anaxagoras says concerning the mixture and things of similar parts. But concerning intellect, he writes as follows. Okay. I was hope these sections are extremely long. Like, and this is still we've been reading the quotation from Simplicius this entire time. And uh that's what we're still on. I guess I'll make it to the next little text section in a couple pages. Ah, but this is like a good break. All right, never mind. We are ending here. Um, we've heard Simplicius trying to reconcile the views of the pre-Socratics, um, which is pretty interesting. You know, a good way to interpret the pre-Socratics. So, um, yeah, Simplicius is a really interesting author. I would like to read all of his works. It's only a few commentaries on Aristotle. And I think one commentary on non-Aristotelian work, but I forget what it is. Not Platonic, but Simplicius was obviously a Platonist at the end of the day. So thanks everyone. 
uh, for listening. We will pick back up next Saturday with this. And hopefully sometime this week, I'll be able to make time for uh, more Timaeus because uh, we got to get through that thing, first of all. So thank you. Take care.